All right, so I know what I do is sort of non-conventional. Right? When we look at the Calvin cycle, generally our first step is carbon fixation, and then we have reduction of 3PGA, and then we have regeneration of RUBP. RUBP, as we know, is ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. However, I always prefer to do steps 2 and 3 first, and that's because First of all, it really doesn't matter what order you do it in, it's a cycle, but Rubisco is kind of the, the more subtle concept. It's a very important thing to understand in plants, and it's going to lead us into talking about C3, C4, and CAM plants. So I do this last. All right, this right here is ribulose-1,5-bisphosphate, or RUBP. The enzyme Rubisco, Rubisco is really an acronym. What it really stands for is ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. All right. It turns out that this enzyme, as we'll go in more detail later, can act as a carboxylase and an oxygenase. Carboxylase is an enzyme that adds carbon to some molecule, usually in the form of carbon dioxide. So ordinarily, carboxylases add carboxyl groups. And oxygenase is an enzyme that uses a lot of times molecular oxygen and it adds oxygen to a molecule. Most certainly the carboxylase is the desired function because Rubisco's main function is supposed to be carbon fixation. Okay, So it turns out that RUBP is a 5-carbon molecule and we need to get it initially to a 6-carbon molecule so we can split it in half and get two 3-carbon molecules. But you can't split a 5-carbon molecule into two 3-carbons. That doesn't make sense. You have to add a carbon to this 5-carbon RUBP to make it a 6-carbon molecule, and then you can split it in half. So RUBP is going to be carboxylated by Rubisco. And the net reaction is we carboxylate Rubisco. The net reaction is we carboxylate RUBP and then split it into two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. And as we mentioned in the previous video, those two 3-phosphoglycerates have the potential to be turned back into glucose. All right, some general information about Rubisco. It has a turnover number of about three molecules per second. This is a very slow enzyme. It's one of the slowest enzymes you'll ever run across. Um, compare it to some enzymes like catalase, which has a turnover of 40 million per second, and compare that to three. Okay, so Rubisco is very slow. So how on earth are plants able to maintain their metabolism with such a slow enzyme? Well, they just simply make a lot of the enzyme. The turnover is low, but the Vmax doesn't have to be low. They can just make a lot of this enzyme, and it turns out Rubisco is thought to be the most abundant protein in the world. Okay, the plants just have to make a ton of it in order to satisfy their metabolic requirements in terms of carbon fixation. And it turns out that Rubisco is a very tightly regulated enzyme. Okay? The ability to do the Calvin cycle is largely regulated by the actual regulation of Rubisco. And we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the regulation, certain parts of it. And the three main ways it's regulated are by the pH of the environment that it's in, an enzyme called Rubisco activase, and then an allosteric, if you want to call it that, modulator called 2-carboxy-D-arabinitol-1-phosphate, which we're just going to abbreviate CA1P. All right. Now, in terms of the pH, we're not going to go much into that, but suffice it to say it has a pH optimum, which is going to be around 9 or greater. Okay. If the pH is less than that, Rubisco's activity drops a lot. Okay, I mean, it turns out that we'll go into this in, a, in another video later, but understand that whenever there is a, the proton pump is activated, remember back to the light de dependent reactions, the cytochrome B6F complex that pumps protons to power ATP synthase, protons affect pH, right? And so depending on how active that proton pump is, that changes the pH and it also changes Rubisco's activity. We're going to look at that in a separate video. All right, but CA1P and Rubisco activase strongly um, modulate this enzyme. All right, so Rubisco normally is going to be inactive at night. Okay, so at night there's a molecule of RUBP that does what we call clogs the active site 
after removal of a critical carbamate group. All right, some things about Rubisco that you have to understand to make this make sense. Rubisco's active site has an unusual uh, functional group in it. All right, and this is this diagram up here. It's kind of confusing, but let's go through it. There has to be a critical carbamate group in order for this enzyme to work. A carbamate group, what it is, is it's essentially a carboxyl group, but instead of being attached to a carbon, it's attached to a nitrogen. And if there's any amino acid that has a, a good nitrogen to do that, it's lysine. So, in other words, a carboxyl group is attached to a lysine R group, and that makes the carbamate. And it turns out this enzyme is only activated when you have that carbamate group. This right here is the carbamate group in sort of a uh, formula form. There's the enzyme itself, here's the lysine attached to a CO2. The enzyme is only activated whenever that carbamate group is present. It can't be the free lysine, okay? And the catalytic cycle in general involves a magnesium chelated to the, carbo to the carbamate group, and then the RUBP chelates to the magnesium. So you have this, this indirect linkage of the carbamate to the magnesium to the RUBP. And only when Rubisco is, Rubisco's active site has this form is it able to function. Okay. Now, what if that carbamate group is not there? as it is over here, okay? In other words, this is a free lysine. It does not have the CO2 attached. It is not a carbamate, all right? It turns out that the enzyme is inactivated. And it turns out also, this generally occurs at night, but instead of having a carbamate group in the magnesium, there's a free lysine, but an RUBP is there instead, all right? It's just a free lysine, not attached to anything, and it's coordinated to RUBP, all right? Some people call this RUBP a storage RUBP, and I would certainly agree with that, but it's mostly considered an inhibitory RUBP, all right? Even though RUBP is the substrate through Rubisco, it's absolutely dependent on this carbamate group. So if that carbamate group is not there and the RUBP is there, it's inhibitory. So there is an enzyme called Rubisco activase, and ultimately what Rubisco activase does is it catalyzes the removal of that RUBP and the insertion of the CO2 that allows formation of the carbamate group. In other words, what Rubisco activase does is it does two things. Removes the inhibitory or storage RUBP and it carbamates or allows the formation of the carbamate residue in the active site. Two things that are required for Rubisco's function. Key here, carbamate is essential for Rubisco's function. Now, to go back to the previous slide, we mentioned there's another regulator called 2-carboxy-D-arabinitol-1-phosphate, CA1P. It turns out that CA1P also, which is shown right here, can actually strongly regulate uh, the function of Rubisco. It turns out that CA1P inhibits the function of Rubisco also. So sometimes plants need to regulate Rubisco in other ways. So they will start making CA1P, as shown here, which can get into the active site and inhibit Rubisco. Okay. In other words, Rubisco is a very strongly regulated enzyme because it really controls the entry into the light-independent reactions. Even though we look at it last in the Calvin cycle, it's what really controls the entry into glucose synthesis.